name's Nolan West. I represent Blaine, Ham Lake, and Columbus uh, for the last four terms. It's been pretty good so far. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, but outside the legislature, I work as a videographer. And uh, personally, I'm just a regular old massive nerd. So I like taking pictures, doing video. Um, I'm married as of, what, I'm almost a year and a half married now. Very nice. Um, so fresh marriage. And I have got one little youngster who is six months, and she's absurdly adorable. Like, <laughs> seriously absurdly adorable. If I didn't set my phone down, I'd be showing you pictures. And uh, yeah, outside the legislature, it's in a standard nerd fair, <laughs> computers and whatnot. And how would you describe your district, 32A? Well, my initial district when I first ran was just Blaine. Mm. It's only Blaine, 24 square miles, yeah. uh, smallest Republican district in the state. Um, and yeah, 72,000 people in Blaine now. I grew up there, and it was about 30,000 when I was right. a wee little lad. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you go up to Ham Lake and Columbus, my other two cities, they are incredibly independent. So I have two very different communities. Blaine is a suburban community that's very densely packed, 72,000 people. Mm -hmm. Then you go up to Ham Lake, which is, has a one acre minimum lot size. Right. So that alone makes it a lot different. They also is, are entirely well water and deliberately so. They don't want anything to do with the Met Council. Uh, which I find that uh, very impressive. The city really has a very distinct flavor. And Columbus has, I think it's a three acre minimum lot size. So then it goes even larger. So those communities are very, very independent. And you know they want government to stay out of their business and go about their lives. And Blaine is a little different to where it's such a growing community. It needs a lot of engagement with government. And 72,000 people are naturally going to lead to that. So. Yeah, it's a very, it's a big suburb, 10th largest city, and then two cities that are very, like, exurban, I guess, I think. Is a lot of people here sure. And uh, talk about Highway 65. For those folks that haven't traveled it, I did growing up, how much of it is in your district, and why was it so important to get funding for, for that road? Yeah, so it, Highway 65 has always been a lot of my district. I actually lost a good chunk of it um, in redistricting, like a mile of it. Uh, but it is the worst road in the state. If anybody's ever driven on it, they know. One of the worst problems with it, so we have the National Sports Center in Blaine mm -hmm. with over, well over like 3 million, 3.2 million visitors a year. Uh, when the USA Cup's in town, we have over a thousand soccer teams. So you have like, what, 20 people on a soccer team, a thousand, we're at quite a few people come through here. And in order to get there, they almost all have to drive on 65, yeah. which is just an unmitigated disaster. So it really was a bad look for our state to have such a terrible road that our biggest tourist attraction after the Mall of America, that's what people see. Right. So yeah, in the last session, we got over a hundred million, well over a hundred million dollars, and that will fix the worst part of the road. I, I imagine it'll kind of move the problem down a little bit, and we'll probably need one more big round of funding. But that is going to be huge. And that construction will start uh, sometime next year. Or, well, I'll wait. For, <laughs> hopefully, at the end, of the, uh, the end of construction season, they can start. Some of it will be done in 2025, though. But that is huge. And you were happy with the Highway 65 funding, but you were critical about some of the other policies that became law in one of your recent legislative updates, but what bothered you about last session? Well, one of the worst parts of last session was just the lack of voice for the minority of, not just like the minority party, but the, the, the Minnesotans. I would say the majority of Minnesotans weren't listened to. It was very, uh, the beautiful thing of when you have a divided government with Republicans in the Senate and Democrats in the House, as we've had for most, for like last four years, um, is both sides, of any issue have a way to address their grievances. Mm -hmm. But what we saw in this last session is the opposing side was a, not even listened to at all. I, w I was shocked. For example, I think the perfect example is with the paid, fam pa paid family leave bill that was passed um, that's not going into effect for a while. We made the case that it's not funded. It's not funded at all. It's egregiously underfunded. Before we pass this and allocate over a billion dollars, we should have an actuarial analysis. Nope. Oh, it's fine. It's going to be fine. Sure enough, as soon as that's done, but the bill is already passed and now law, it's 40% underfunded. 40%. Like, that's an enormous number. Like, imagine if you did your own budget and you were 40% off, you'd be in tough straits. So you look at things like that, and I think because uh, the other side wasn't listened to throughout the legislative process and passing all these bills and spending $18 billion, which a normal budget cycle is like an 8 to 10% increase in the budget, 
and this was like a 20% increase, just, or 38% increase, that's what it was. Just in astronomical numbers. Uh, so that was very frustrating when things are being done that are all incredibly extreme, unprecedented, and when there's glaring issues, they just, because they don't have to listen to the other side, they don't. And then you consider the Senate only has 34 Democrats, 33 Republicans. The House is almost as close. So it's, it's not like there was a mandate or a landslide win. It was hardly eked out. And you can tell they're trying to get as much done as they possibly can before the next election. And looking at all the, there's a lot of senior member Democrats who are retiring. I guarantee you they don't want to deal with the next budget cycle. They just don't want it because it's going to be bad. Um, most recent budget forecast projected a $2.4 billion surplus. How did you feel about those numbers? Or how do you feel about those numbers? Well, it's a $2.4 billion surplus in the short term and a $2.3 billion deficit three to four years after that. Well, three to four years after now. So I'm worried that people are calling it a surplus because whenever a politician talks about a surplus, they want to spend it. And when we already know we're going to be in the hole, maybe we shouldn't. If we don't spend any of it, hey, we might be able to afford it. And that was one problem with the budgeting in the last cycle is rather than doing it as we've always done it, they, a lot of programs are funded in little increments, one-time funding for, say, four years. And then there's this massive drop-off. And that's going to create a nasty issue to deal with when you're looking at a 4 to $6 billion budget deficit or whatever we're going to be at. Um, a recession will come eventually. It's amazing that it hasn't. And I'm very worried that, like, our state budget reserve is nice and juicy right now, but it, I, it, it goes quick once we hit hard economic times, which, I mean, will eventually happen. And you serve on the House Capital Investment Committee. First, did you make any trips around the state to look at some potential projects in, in the interim here? I did last year, okay. um, but not this year. I was uh, full-time baby duty. Well, I, I, I suppose <laughs> your hands were full, but well, I guess what do you expect for a bonding proposal this year? What, what would make sense for you? And I think passing There's any bonding is going to be incredibly difficult, really more difficult than it normally day. is, uh, just because of the last budget was $18 billion dollars spent. It's like, it at some point, we have to stop spending money. Although there's a lot of good things to bond for, I would love if the bonding bill was just about things Minnesotans actually need, like wastewater infrastructure, roads and bridges. But inevitably, it starts funding like comedy centers and ice arenas and swimming pools. And it's like, well, these, these are nice things, but these aren't what we should be bonding for as a state. So assuming it's as it normally is, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to get anything past this session. So I guess that's what I'd like to see. It actually be, if it was entirely infrastructure based, we could solve a lot of problems, but it never is because politics. And just finally, what would you like to work on or what do you think uh, the House should address this year? in 2024. Yeah, well, sports betting is going to come up. That's going to be very big. Uh, and that has been incredibly frustrating to deal with because broadly, Minnesotans are supportive of legalizing sports betting. But when you pull them on the tribal exclusive sports betting, that number is less than 10%. And the only proposals that have shown any life are tribal exclusive, which will destroy one of the biggest employer in Columbus. Uh, running aces horse track, when you look at other states where sports betting has been legalized, the tracks get hurt bad. And if they're not even allowed to participate, when you look, they're the only group right now taking sports bets presently. But when this legislation passed, they're considered they're not ready for it. So that's incredibly frustrating. I, we should pass sports betting. I'm super supportive. I'm one of the more libertarian members of the House, I would say. But uh, a tribal exclusive sports betting is not the way it should be done. I mean, they certainly will have their interests protected because they should have their interests protected, but we can't do that at the cost of everyone else. That's, that's inappropriate. So I think that's going to be a big issue. Also, the cannabis bill that was passed, um, to put it lightly, was pretty not entirely well thought out because the goal was to pass the bill quickly. I still voted for it because I support the concept, but it's incredibly frustrating that we've already seen how poorly it's rolling out. The director was hired and then quit two days later. It's been an unmitigated disaster to this point. And talking to them, they sound like I'm not super optimistic that it'll be fixed. But I know there is support. Like, we can fix these problems. So I'm hoping we can get some movement fixing the problems in the new Office of Cannabis before it becomes a true disaster. I mean, 
I don't even think people want the job after what happened to the first person at this point. So we need, those two things I think will be very big this session and bonding. Um, those I think will be the three big issues. I'm, the $18 billion spent kind of takes care of, I can't imagine spending any more money when you spend $18 billion. But, so that's what I see going forward.